Woensdag die 14e februari, ons gaan aan met Destiny. Who the hell and Mamba stilled? For the first time, he noticed the name, Tango Mike. He saw the stab of flames from the dense bush again, the violent jab in his side and the horrible screams of his men as they died in the deadly crossfire of the boer ambush. More by instinct than anything else, he'd hurdled himself against the ground and crawled as fast as he could out of the killing zone. Behind him, the gunfire continued. He heard the explosions of the hand grenades being hurdled into the killing zone and the continuous stuttering of the machine guns. It was an awful memory that would stay with him forever. That was Tango Mike. Involuntarily, his hand touched his side and there was a sudden coldness inside him. Tango Mike had killed every man in that patrol. And here he was again. Matthias knew the story. During the drunken brawl one night in Huambu, Mamba had confided in him. He could see the stillness in his commander's eyes. A sideways glance showed that the younger suspecting the youngster suspected nothing and he did not notice the hatred in Mamba's eyes. Go and wait for the others, he barked. The youngster hastily scrambled out of sight to receive the rest of the patrols as they came in. He hurt your reputation. He took your blood, Matthias mused. Maybe this is your chance to even the score. No, Mamba shook his head slowly. He is too cunning for that. By tonight they will be gone. Isn't that what you want? Mamba nodded slowly. Yes. That's what they want in Luambu. And you, my friend? What do you want? I want Tango Mike. I want him dead. I want revenge. Then you shall have him, Matthias said gravely. But take your time. Don't let your hatred impede your judgment. Mamba received a similar reply, reply from every patrol as they returned. He listened quietly to the banter amongst the men. The subject was Tango Mike. You know, I will cut off you know what. I will cut off his you know what. Who the hell does he think he is? Mamba froze. Where the hell's, where the hell is those two? They should have been back a long time ago. Taking his rifle, he scrambled up the rocks to a good vantage point. Matthias, realizing his sudden concern, silenced the men with a sharp hiss and went after Mamba. Man coming fast, the lookout told Mamba as he reached the top. Mamba aimed the binoculars on the approaching figure. It's Alfonso, there's trouble, he said. Alfonso came stumbling up the hillside. His clothes were battered and torn and his face distorted with effort. They heard his rasping voice and saw his face glistening with sweat as he stumbled the last couple of paces towards Mamba's party. His eyes were dull with fatigue as he sank to his knees, shoulders heaving as he struggled for breath. His eyes evaded Mamba's. Where's your rifle? Mamba asked. Boers, Matthias prompted. Alfonso nodded wearily. Waiting for us, headman, traitor, he rasped. Unita, water, Mamba said, and Matthias held the tin flask to the exhausted Alfonso's lips. The latter drank greedily and Matthias took the tin away. Simon, dead, between the eyes, Alfonso hung his head gravely. The Boers arrived just as we took the bandit captive. There was nothing that I could do. I came as quickly as possible. So I noticed, Mamba replied solemnly. Matthias, prepare the men. We're moving down as soon as the moon is out. Alfonso's head jerked up. Impossible, comrade. There are too many and they will probably be waiting in ambush. Mamba stared at Alfonso as if he was seeing him for the first time. Too many, he sneered. 
I chose every man from this outfit myself. We can take on every foot patrol the Boers can muster and stood the hell out of them any time, or rather shoot the hell out of them any time, day or night. So what's the matter with you? Matthias nodded his agreement. Maybe Alfonso is scared. Alfonso hung his head. I didn't mean it that way. We'll move down to that crawl as soon as the moon is up. Mamba dismissed them as he stood up. Did he pick the wrong man? Was this man a coward? Not all the members of his newly formed special group were, were experienced in battle. Alfonso was one of them. It was a disturbing thought. He will have to put them to the test. However, it was almost last light when they heard the choppers coming. He knelt beside the lookout and studied the two machines as they swept past. The mottled camouflage of the South African Puma was unmistakable. He felt a little disappointed. The Boo reconnaissance teams were going home. Alfonso had lied to him. Chapter 5 Mamba is back. A general stir went through the conference room. Officers from various services were seated around the large oval table for the weekly general intelligence briefing. The announcement of the recce captain caught them off guard. They all knew about Mamba because his reputation was travelling all over the operational area. But they had also heard about the ambush, which had put him out of action and many had believed him to be dead. And now Tom had dealt them the shocking news. Colonel Henny Lowe smiled thinly at their reaction. He had instructed Captain McLaughlin to brief the weekly meeting himself on the subject of Mamba. It posed to no immediate threat. However, Mamba was still someone to be reckoned with, especially his ability to execute deep infiltrations and special tanks behind the lines and then disappeared without a trace. It is clear to us that there is a massive build-up of forces around Kahama. Mamba was sent in to prevent our small teams from discovering this fact. He went overboard to make his presence in the area very clear to us. His pattern is still the same. He had left notes at all the water holes, telling us that it had been poisoned. By doing this, he wanted to create panic and force us to either leave the area or make careless mistakes so that he could move in for the kill. The approximate strength of his party is about 15 men and all well trained. Tom paused and grinned. At least there are only 14 of them left. We killed one. How do you know he didn't really poison the water? The artillery officer asked. I drank it, Tom answered dryly. It's also logical. If he had poisoned the water holes, there would be no water for him. Sitting at the far side of the table, Leslie Ann paled. Of all the stupidity she thought alarmed. To drink from the water without certainty, he could have died. Across the conference room, Tom's eyes caught hers and she quickly dropped her gaze to the notepad in front of her. She had no idea he would attend this meeting. As she represented the medical section, there was nothing she could do to avoid him or miss the briefing. It seldom happened that one of the recce operators attended the general intelligence briefing. They were normally represented by Major Connor Loy, an intelligence officer attached to the Raki base. Involuntarily, she glanced at him. The Major was staring at Tom. His face was grim and there was just a trace of red around his neck as if he was annoyed at what Tom was saying and her personal dislike in the man intensified. What makes this Mamba so special? An infantry officer asked. It was obvious that he was new to the area. Leslie Ann lifted her eyes to Tom. 
This was also the first time that she had heard of him. Uh, he's a damn good ter. Tom used the abbreviation for terrorist. And he knows the job. When the briefing was finally over, it was tea time. The officers strolled through the garden where tea and sandwiches were served. Tom held himself and over the heads of the others, he saw Leslie Ann where she stood, surrounded by a couple of junior officers. Good looking, Major Connolly remarked quietly, and very popular. Tom experienced a flare of irritation. He had never actually developed a liking for him. He believed the feeling was mutual. Leslie Ann had always been special to him. Ever since her father started working at McLaughlin Wineries, she was around. She had come to him many times with her problems. They were like brother and sister. Then came the day when Barry McLaughlin fired his, her father after some difference in opinion and an argument. Tom, Tom had never forgiven his father for that. He remembered finding her in her favorite spot in the vineyards. She was crying and he held her in his arms, trying to console her. After a long time, she looked up into his eyes. Will I ever see you again, Tom? Yes, he had told her softly. Looking at her now, he felt sad that their first encounter in all those years was such a disaster. There was a tightness in his throat at the thought that he would leave to be married. As he watched Leslie Ann, he had a sudden urge to talk to her and to explain where it had gone wrong. Have you met her? Major Connolly chirped. Back off, Tom muttered with unnecessary force and walked away to where his land cruiser was parked. He was still annoyed when he pulled through the gate at the fort. Flowers. Where the hell did one find flowers in Ondangwa? On Tom chased two of his corporals to town with a stern warning not to come back without a bunch of roses. However, after Snake explained the impossibility of such a mission, he settled for any kind of flowers, but flowers it will be. By late afternoon, there was still no sign, sign of his two emissionaries. It was then that Tom thought of Dan Retief's wife. Dan was a Puma pilot and his wife, Rosie, always had a patch of flowers somewhere in her garden. A telephone call to Rosie and the promise of crayfish and Cape Red wines secured a colourful bunch of flowers just before sunset. Armed with the flowers and a bottle of champagne, he turned the Land Rover towards nearby Oshikati. There was also a picnic basket which John von Sale had obtained from the cook. Tom seldom visited the sector headquarters at Oshikati, but it wasn't difficult to find the officers' quarters near the hospital. A friendly corporal was only too willing to direct him towards the female quarters. With a good luck, Captain, he found himself alone in front of Les Leslie Ann's door. He felt very awkward and a little uncomfortable. He could hear a shower running inside, so at least he knew she was there. He had to knock twice before a mumbled reply told him to wait. Her blonde hair was wet and droplets dangled from the locks as the hand that was uh, tidying it froze. Her deep blue eyes grew wide and her lips formed a quiet O oh, as she recognized her visitor. Tom stared unashamedly at her. He had never seen her look so beautiful. Her surprise was genuine as he saw the sudden flicker of joy in her eyes. Tom, I, um, I, I come in, wait. She then realized that she was only wearing her gown. Give me a few minutes, I just want to put on something decent. The door was shut in his face before he could even utter a word. When she emerged, ten minutes later, Tom was halfway through his second cigarette. 
It only seemed natural that she stood on tiptoe and kissed him lightly on the lips. Flowers was all that he could get out. She smiled as she took it from his hands. He fervently hoped that she wouldn't notice his loss of words. Come in, she invited and led the way. Tom stepped in surprise. He stopped in surprise. Her room was very far from anything resembling the army. How she had done it, he never knew. She must have bribed every clerk and storeman on the entire border. There was everything from wall to wall carpeting to large lazy chairs. The walls were decorated with tapestries and paint paintings. Tom noticed that the room was connected to another one, which served as a bedroom. Indeed, privileged. I came to fetch you for dinner, he told her. He could hear her in the bathroom. There was a moment's silence before she hesitantly replied. Do you think it's wise? I mean, you are getting married. I just want to talk, to explain, um, the last time. There's nothing to explain. She appeared in the door, brushing her hair with furious strokes. I perfectly understand. Besides, I've decided not to see you again. Well, you've let me in. It was a mistake. You took me by surprise. Listen, Liz, I've fixed a picnic basket for us. Come with me. Let me talk to you. I won't bother you again after that. She stared at him. The use of her pet name took all her willpower away. She wanted to be with him. She had steeled herself for this moment, not wanting the pain she had suffered after his first rejection at Fort Fire. Yet, even as she stared at Tom, she knew she could not send him away. She was afraid to lose him. At that moment, she hated the woman who would be Tom's wife. All her life, she had dreamed about them being together and now she had lost him to another woman. The realization that this was perhaps their last opportunity to be together changed her mind. Ten minutes later, she was with Tom in his land cruiser. When she realized he was driving into the bush towards the perimeter of the base, she frowned at him. Tom grinned and drove on quietly, until he swung in under a large camel thorn tree. Far away from anyone, but protected by the base patrols and guard posts, he smiled. Let's enjoy the evening. When are you leaving? In a fortnight, he said. She nodded, okay. We will have a little time. He cooked dinner in his ancient three-legged pot and they drank the sparkling wine and talked about the old days and the years in between. She told him about her career, her years at university, but when he asked her about the future, she was silent. How could she tell him that he was the inspiration for every dream she ever had? That the hope of finding him somewhere on the border inspired her to join the army, despite the numerous offers she had had from private practices. They stared at the red glowing coals, and the dark of the night was close around them. In the far distance, the sound of a huge power generator were comforting. Tom looked up and found Leslie Ann staring at him. He started talking, first hesitantly, then with more confidence. She did not interrupt him, but listened as he told her about his father the ever-dominant figure who ruled everyone in the family with a tight hand, who fervently hated the army and everything it stood for, for how his future had been planned for him in order to expand the family's riches, his planned marriage to Cecile and the amalgamation of the two wineries. In a single move, his father would control the largest private winery in the Southern Hemisphere. And he told her about his own love for the farm, his mother and how he feared losing it all. Yet, the problems of working with his father daunted him. He would have preferred to stay in the force until such a day 
as he could take over the farm and the winery without any interference from Barry McLaughlin. When he lapsed into silence, they sat quietly for a long time. The fire was down to a few coals and the Ubambu night was very dark. In the distance, there was a staccato of gunfire and spirits of red streaked into the sky. Tracers, Tom said, this war could go on forever. Leslie Ann noticed the despair in his voice. She knew in his heart he would be a soldier forever. I will miss it. And I will miss you, she thought. Her own despair brought tears to her eyes, but it was too dark for him to see. They were pushing hard, running where they could. It was well past midnight when they ran into the Cuban lines at Kahama. A truck was ready and waiting for them. It quickly brought them to the headquarters of the combined Cuban and FAPLA forces. Mamba jumped down and saw the waiting figure in the darkness. It was Colonel Tonasio. Where is he? he asked as they gripped hands. Mamba nodded towards where Alfonso was shoved from the truck. With his hands tied, he lost his balance and fell into the dirt. He was hauled to his feet immediately and dragged to where Mamba was standing with the colonel. He betrayed the revolutionary discipline and let his lust interfere with our mission. By doing so, he allowed a bandit to escape. He arrived back at my hiding spot without his rifle and left a spur for any boor to follow. It is a very serious transgression of the trust bestowed upon us by the High Command. He is not fit to serve in the special units. Donacio nodded. So be it. He will be sent to Kwanzaa Rehabilitation Camp on the first plane in the morning. No, Alfonso croaked and tried to feeble struggle against the hands that held him. It will be an example to every man, Donacio said. Take him away. There are new orders awaiting you. Donacio told Mamba as the two men disappeared into the underground bunker. Your team can rest the retain for the next three days and then here and then there is a mission for you. A tough one. Final orders from Luanda will be issued then, but let's talk in the morning. First, a drink, and then you can fill me in on what happened to Simon and Alfonso. Donacio's bunker was well furnished, and Mamba glanced enviously at the fridge from which the colonel fetched two cold Cuban beers. I also have a letter for you. It was from Gina. The underground bunker, which served as the operations room, was musty and warm. The single bulb dangling from the sandbank roof threw a ghostly light over the table and the operations map against the wall. A fan in the corner of the room gave very little comfort to the men around the table and had less effect on the swirling smoke from the Habana cigar. Lieutenant Colonel Tunasio temporarily appointed as the intelligence officer concerning specific swap operations was sweating heavily despite his thin features. He had complete comrade Mamba's briefing and although the latter was quiet throughout the whole hour, he knew that Mamba had missed nothing. Smoking was prohibited in the confined space of the operations room, but he had quietly handed a Havana to each of the two men and indulged one himself. Knowing Mamba, he now awaited the storm of questions which he knew would follow. Mamba, his face like a mask, savoured the Havana for a couple of minutes, eyeing Tenacio across the table. So, Luanda wants me to walk into a Boer camp, grab one by his elbow and ask him politely to follow me all the way into Angola because certain members of the Central Committee want him there so that he could be used as a key for free comrade General Bomba, who is presently in prison at a place 
ko kai kana gap neer Mariental. Easy. There was just a trace of concern in his voice, and Tunasio briefly smiled. Something along that lines, yes. And, comrade, what backup will I have? Backup? You must bear in mind, comrade, that this isn't just any type of operation. When we snatch a boor, and hell will break out south, all hell will break out south of here. Within six hours, the whole province of Namibe will be crawling with soldiers. There will be more ambushes than wars on the streets of Guatemala. And with the handicap of a prisoner, it's highly unlikely that we will be able to bypass all of them. I need a quick lift back, at least. How long before you can cross the border back into Angola? Well, that depends. Mamba let his eyes roam over the map of Namibia, inhaling deeply on the cigar. Previous experience had taught him that there were considerable movement between the towns of Oshikati and Ondangwa. Although there were curfews in place now, so if he could cause a considerable distraction, it might cause a breaching of the curfew regulations and that might offer him a chance. So the road between Ondangwa and Oshikati was perhaps better. Five hours. We could be back across the border at dawn, Mamba replied quietly. Tanasio nodded his approval. It confirmed his estimation. We shall have a platoon waiting for you. A mechanized platoon with BTRs and BRDMs. You could be back here by nine o'clock. By twelve, our prisoner will be landing in Luanda. Good. Mamba smiled for the first time. Leave Matthias and me to work out the details. We will move out by nightfall three days from now with the mechan uh, mechanized, mechanized platoon, naturally. For the next two days, Mamba exercised his troops to exhaustion. From early the morning until long after nightfall, they were up and busy as he painstakingly drilled every aspect of his well-planned operation into them. On the third morning, he let them sleep until noon, and while most of the Cubans were seeking the comfort of shady trees, his men were doing the final preparations. They shook hands when the vehicle started moving, and Tenacio reminded him to exercise extreme caution. Mamba grilled, grinned reassuringly down at him as he waved the driver along. The drive was short and they were dropped off less than 60 miles from Kaama, north of the Kudeni, for few would dare to cross the river into territory dominated by the South African and UNITA forces. Mamba spat in disgust as, at this cowardly behavior and told Matthias to take two men and find a suitable crossing for the rest of the group. They crossed the river at a rapid five kilometers downstream and Mamba wasted little time. He wanted to reach the Namibian border in three nights time. He pushed his team throughout the night. At the first sight of dawn, he dog-legged back and went into a hiding from where they could watch their tracks in case they had been followed. They slept all day and when the first stars appeared in the evening sky, Mamba picked his bearing from the Southern Cross and started out. They travelled single file with Mamba in the lead, trying to avoid all possible ambush positions and stay clear of the South African logistical routes. The last thing he wanted now was contact with the enemy. The closer they got to the border, the more careful he moved. But there were no incidents, and they reached the Namibian border the following night. The temporary base they had selected was less than three kilometers from the border on the Angolan side, which was well clear of any logical population. Mamba's instruction was clear and stern. No one was allowed to move around unnecessarily to minimize the possibility of detection 
by scout planes or Boer patrols that might stray across the border. That happened enough. That happened often enough. The next evening, Mamba changed into civilian clothes and tucked his Makarov pistol behind his back. Taking care that he had all the necessary documents and enough money in rands, he left Matthias in control of his guerrillas and set out for the border. It was midnight when he was finally satisfied that everything was safe before he crossed into Ubambu, heading for the St. Mary's mission at Engela. Father Dumitri, the Catholic priest, was already in bed when there was a light tap on his window. Knowing instantly that it was one of the resistance fighters, he hurried from his room and cautiously opened the back door of his premises. For years, the Catholics and St. Mary's were sympathetic towards Swabu's cause. They often helped in a way of information and treating the injured. More often, however, they only provided medicine and a blessing to a fast traveling fighter. To the fast traveling fighter. Now he gasped with shock as he recognized the strong black man in the shadows. Timothy! Almost instantly his features changed to delight. Come on, my young friend, come in. The good Lord answered my prayers. Timothy Shikongu quickly stepped through the door and closed it. Father, his voice was low. It has been years. They embraced quickly, both a little embarrassed. Timothy used to come to the mission often when he was still a little boy. Although the father had realized that the reason was perhaps the bag of sweets he had under his clerical robes, he never discouraged the youngster. Then, years later, Mamba had returned, now a man, and the father had more than once been an invaluable aid in the execution of his numerous covert inland operations. I, I heard you were dead. Mamba grinned. Not that easily, father. You will still see me around when independence comes to our country. Father Dimitri chuckled. I can see you have changed a little. I know better than to ask where you were all this time. Now, my friend, what can I do for you? I need information, said Mamba. Ons sal morgen aand dan aangaan met hoofstuk 6 van Destiny.